Or whatever, I'm just a pretty voice. Listening to Marxism today. This is Red Wagner and Tony Schmidt. And Tony and I were just talking, and we realized we had recorded some episodes without really. I don't know. I guess we've acknowledged the fact that you're here and that we're kind of co-hosts at this point. But we we haven't gotten to know you really, Tony. Yeah. So I figure it, it would be worth our while to to get to know you a little bit. You, I'll I'll give you just the most open ended possible question that's available. Tell us a little bit about yourself. I hate those questions. Uh, <laughs> my name is Tony Schmidt. Uh, I am a Marxist. I, I normally call myself a democratic socialist. Um, I'm also a member of the local Democratic Socialists of America for the Madison. I am a member of the AFSME local union, or local 60, because um, I, I work, as is alluded to or mentioned in a couple other places, I work at the uh, public library in Sun Prairie. Yep. I, uh, I work in circulation, so if you... Uh, if you see me and I'm checking you out, you should say hi, and then we can say hi. I'm not good at conversing with people when I check them out. <laughs> so a hi and a hi, huh? Yeah, a hi and a hi. Okay. Hi and a hi and an awkward silence. <laughs> what it is. I'm like, oh, it's weird that you know my last name. It doesn't say that in my name tag. Um, but so circulation, though, is yeah. that means that you might check me out. Yep. And if I return my book, you're going to put it back on the shelf? Is that what it is? I check it in. Okay. I used to shelf things. Oh, oh it's uh, different than shelving. Yeah. You, like, scan it and put it on a cart? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I used to I used to shelf long ago. Okay. For years. Oh, I think I have to ask you this. This is kind of the, the starter question. Where did your interest in socialism begin? This is also going to be kind of an unsatisfying answer because I don't have a really good answer for that. I, uh, my mom, um, the best I can figure how I sort of got into this is my mom, for years and years and years as I was younger, um, worked with a group providing, uh, meals and some toys around, uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving to needy families, uh, in Sun Prairie. She was active in, you know, lefty thing like that. And, I don't know, I've just always sort of been to the left normally, considered myself progressive. And then at some point, I considered myself a socialist. I don't couldn't give you definitive time, but I would identify as a socialist if people asked me. And then, I never really put a ton of thought into it or study until um, somebody I worked with, uh, Vince, or invited me to go to uh, a DSA meeting with him. So it was really in joining the DSA that I really started to study and read and read and read and study and try and learn everything I could about socialism. And, you know, even though I identify that, because I wanted to be able to speak about it more intelligently, and I've read, studied, and continue to a lot. And the more I read and study, the more I see that's exactly where I fall. And I... Now, th this is interesting to me because I didn't, I, for some reason I had in my mind that you self-identified as a socialist long before joining DSA. Yeah. It, is that true? Yeah, I self-identified for, I don't know, probably starting in high school, and I hadn't joined the DSA for, I don't know, uh five to seven years after then. Okay. So... Yeah, I mean, that's I, a decent chunk of time. Yeah, but I never really thought of it more past, I guess, the general conception of socialism in America, and that is, you know, Social Security, um, Medicaid, health care, you know, sort of just the, the 
expanded social state and you know something about equality but I didn't didn't really put much thought into I mean I certainly was never a fan of capitalism but I didn't put you know the, the I didn't put much thought into it beyond sort of a superficial level like that sure yeah that makes sense like like a general distaste for capitalism but not like a an analytical understanding of it or deconstruction yeah. of it sort of yeah thing. exactly i didn't like it but i couldn't tell you exactly why i didn't like it now how long have you been in the dsa <sighs> that's a good question um i joined well i joined sometime after the wisconsin uprising oh. um i'm trying to remember if my son was born yet or not i don't no. So it's going to be about three years, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, somewhere around three years. I thought for sure your son had been born, but wow, okay. He That's might have been. I could not tell you exactly. I, My memory is a little spacey between all that stuff with the uprising and having a new baby and joining uh -huh. the DSA. Do you so. think our listeners all know what the Wisconsin uprising is? Oh boy, I would hope so. Maybe. <laughs> I mean, explain. we're we live in Wisconsin, so that it's very clear to us. But well, I guess we could. Uh, this I would I would not expect an international listener to know. Do you uh, think? Do you think people from other countries know what the Wisconsin uprising is? I think that possibly. You, really? You want to? Well, I mean, when it was happening, like Tunisia had expressed the Tunisian. Um, protesters had expressed support for Wisconsin in their struggle, so... Yes, but that that only takes one I, okay, protester yeah. to yeah. hold up a sign for that. You know, it's not like everyone in Tunisia knew what was going on in Wisconsin. Yeah. Yeah, would would you like to explain that? Because I'm guessing you could better I, than I. Well, I mean, I'd, uh, I'll ask you to jump in here, too. We'll, we'll see if we can kind of piece this together in a way. Uh, the Wisconsin Uprising, Wisconsin State in the U.S., uh, wa have a governor, and had a governor at this time, uh, Scott Walker, Republican governor, who introduced, uh, his budget repair bill, is what the name of it was, which is a wonderful sounding name, right? Budget Act repair. 10. Yeah. Actually. Yeah, later, later referred to as Act 10. I guess it was, always was Act 10, but it, he called it a budget repair bill. And it was supposed to kind of like sneak through, like it was. It kind of had this innocuous name, and it was kind of supposed to just kind of get passed through without anyone really looking at it. Well, it turns out people did look at it, and it was like a union gutting bill. Like it, it took away the vast majority of union rights that most people had, especially in public employee unions. It, that's what it was really focused on, excluding police and firemen. Yes, which was a strategic move on his part. He knew that the police and firemen voted for him, although I've heard recently that he started coming after them, too. Yeah. But, anyway, the uh, the bill... W and, and there were actually lots of things about it. The union stuff gets the most attention, but, like, there were big cuts to the state Medicaid program and and just all sorts of things that... Were where state workers and poor people and people that relied on assistance were were getting uh, cuts basically, and um, the and and so there was a huge outrage. There there was a a fight back against it that you know you kind of. I got a call from several different unions, actually. From really? a AFT called me. I used to be in AFT, uh, American Federation of Teachers. Huh. And WEAC might have called me, too. I can't remember now, because I used to also be in WEAC, which is Wisconsin Education Association Council, which is another teacher's union. I did not get any union calls. I, uh... Oh, really? Because was... you're an AFSCME. Yeah. AFSCME was very present at the protest. I wasn't a member of AFSCME. I believe I was unemployed at the time. Oh. Yeah, but I had been for five years, um, not super long before that. So I'm yeah. a little surprised I didn't get any call from them. That Yeah, that's interesting because even though uh, I was employed at the time, but not by uh, a teaching profession. 
So I got a call from a union that represented a previous job placement that I had, not a current one. You know, my, my current workplace is uh, non-unionized, so the, yeah, there wasn't anything going on there. But yeah, very, so the, and it was, it went on for forever, it feels like. Like, just day after day, people were protesting, marching around the Capitol Square. The weekends got really big. And this was February in Wisconsin. Yeah. Like, this was, it was cold. People were protesting in the snow. They had their mittens on and everything. And, oh, my God. It was, I mean, in one way, it was really exciting. Because there was all that energy that that you really haven't seen from the labor movement and just, you know, people coming together all to support each other, both the union and non-union workers and, and people that just cared about society as a whole coming out and, and uh, well, in this case, showing their opposition to, to Walker's bill. Yeah, and I mean, it was, and and it ended up going through, unfortunately, is the sad story of it, is that it, it did, in, in in the end, go through. And well, the, and there were all sorts of um, things to try, uh, other attempts to stop it, like the Wisconsin state senators left the state yep, okay. to prevent the state senator Republican majority from getting a quorum, because they had a majority, but not strong enough majority to have a quorum. So they left the state to stop the bill from going through but but eventually they had to come back and I don't know I believe the actual vote was called they did the yays quick did an a and then called the vote I believe if I'm correct oh they yeah. they well, went they... oh look we have a quorum all in favor yay on the opposed all right done yeah and they can do that because I have no idea why <laughs> but uh but yeah that that was I wouldn't be surprised if it was a radicalizing time for many people. I mean, that's that's a political education right there. Yeah. Uh, on well, and actually, one I mean, one unfortunate thing was the timing of it was right in the time when so many young people were unemployed, because I, I, young people can often be the most active. Not that they have to be, but it, many times they are just because they have fewer life commitments. It would have been a, a better education for young people if some of if fewer of them had been unemployed. Like you know, there's I run into so many pe young people that have no idea what it means to be in a union, like why unions exist. Like I, I've had many people at my current workplace um, who you know we have, there's a lot of young people that work there. And and we're non-unionized, so many of them have no understanding of of what a union means at all. And they they've said to me things very honestly, saying, "I don't understand what it's all about. What's why why is this an issue?" Um, we, yeah, I mean, we kind of laugh at that, and but it's they it's a totally honest question. Like they're not being jerks about it, and you know, I sit down, I explain it. And and they say, oh, okay, now now it kind of all makes sense. But yeah, they just don't know. Yeah, and I mean, our workplaces are quite different. So, I mean, not that there's not a place for a union at your workplace. I definitely think one would be nice there. But um, mine, mm -hmm. where I am a union member, but I mean, we don't collect, we can't collectively bargain. Me and Not I... me more after yeah. at 10. See, yeah. yeah, that was... I didn't mention that on oh, the yeah. cast here. I should have said that. Yeah, so you you are technically allowed to still have a union, but yep. you basically can't do anything. Yeah, the union is allowed to try and bargain for base wages, and I don't know if, in my particular circumstance, I don't know if the city actually does that. Um... I know that the union memberships died off considerably because you also no longer um, can automatically deduct uh, union dues from everyone, which sounds weird to people who aren't unions. But the thing with unions prior to this was that the unions argued um, and bargained for the wages 
So even if you weren't a union employee, if you worked in a position that was a union position, you made more money than you otherwise would have through the efforts of the union. Therefore, the union was compensated for the work they did on your behalf because, well, they were automatically doing it on your behalf. Yeah. I mean, I think this is a very important point that most people don't understand. And and I want to draw a parallel with um, this and some like a basic government service, like roads, right? Like, we all pay taxes to maintain roads, and the, and the government does that for us. A union is sort of like a government for the employees, where the employees all pitch in and the union does something to benefit those employees, name, namely collectively bargain, like it, it, it can uh, bargain with the employer. Because let's face it, if you've got 10 million employees, or, you know, some law, it doesn't even need to be 10 million, if you've got 50 employees and one employer, it's easy for the employer to get the upper hand there, right? Uh, because the, just by the nature of the market, there's fewer of them, so they've, they've got a more consolidated, you know, bargaining power. So a union, the idea is, okay, we'll unify the employees, and now we're kind of on even footing. We've got one group of employees and one employer. If each employee individually gets to decide whether or not they're going to pay dues, there's no individual incentive to pay those dues. It would be like if individually every citizen of the United States got to decide if they were going to pay taxes. Well, there's no incentive for me as an individual to pay taxes, but if everyone decides that, which is the logical conclusion of each individual, then you end up with it's just an awful society that can't function and doesn't have running water or decent roads or anything. And that's basically what they're trying to do to unions, is they want to make the unions so underfunded that they can't function and no one believes in them anymore. That's, that's the whole purpose of making union dues voluntary. You know, the, let's do that with the government, with, with federal taxes for one year and see how long it lasts. I mean... Let's not, because people will die if we try to do that. Like, lots of people will die. Yeah. Um, but if it, it, would, it would really not take very long to figure out that this was the worst idea that someone could think of. Yeah, and it's actually, I don't know if you saw, I, can't, I don't remember the course, or case name, but the Supreme Court recently struck another blow to labor in, in Illinois the United Service Workers uh, Union, I believe, represents by law all um, part-time or partial state employees who go and provide health care, like in housing. So, you know, any government subsidized, um, like, at-home care, all of those people are by law represented by uh, United Service Workers now. Uh, but the Supreme Court has now made it so that they don't have to pay dues automatically to that, but the union is still bound by law to represent everyone there. So that'll be awful and interesting in yeah. a bad way. <laughs> but it is, it, it's not, it could be a bit worse because the, again, I can't remember the name of the group, the group that threw themselves behind this lawsuit trying to open it up as a freedom of speech thing, barring unions from being able to basically speak on anyone's behalf as a sort of you're stealing my freedom of speech argument, which thankfully the Supreme Court didn't go that far, but it's still a decent chunk of a blow to union power. That was a really good foray into the world of... Um... Union politics, yeah. but at, so the Wisconsin uprising is what what drove you to to pursue being more interested in socialism and doing something about it. Yeah, well, sort of. Um, that's it was around that time that I joined the DSA, or a little bit after that. Not necessarily specifically because of that, but that certainly 
was a bit of a tipping point, obviously. Uh-huh. I, that's, um, I mean, the for the sort of revitalization of the Madison DSA, that definitely was it. Plus, um, another group I work with in Sun Prairie, which I guess I should have mentioned in my introduction as well. Oh, yeah. It's Sun Prairie Action Resource Coalition. There we go. So, they're a progressive group in Sun Prairie who started by organizing to collect recall signatures, which I suppose we should get into the recall then, too, if we're going to jump forward after the failed, uh, well, not really failed uprising, the uprising that didn't create or prevent the law from being passed Mm -hmm. happened. Um, The Democrats largely jumped on to, along with the unions, and depending on who you talk to, it was the Democrat of the unions, some of the unions' plan all along, was to try and do a recall of the governor and lieutenant governor, because for some reason those are separate, uh, to force a new election and see if they could ouster him. And there were enough signatures to get the recall election happening, but because a lot of people thought that the recall was just a reactionary lashing out, which it certainly was. Um, it didn't work, and Walker was unfortunately re-elected with an even higher margin than he did before. Yeah. Which is very depressing. Yeah. It was a depressing night. Yeah. And, I mean, there's a lot of stuff to say about this. I mean, uh, I don't know how much I want to relive this right now. Yeah. But... Yeah, like if I talk to my friends who are Democrats, they'll say the problem was that they didn't get a good enough Democrat to run against Walker. Which is that, a partial problem. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, totally, because I I think their candidate was not super strong. But another reaction was the amount of out-of-state money spent on the elections, which is a big thing, you know, the idea that someone is funding these elections who really is not supposed to be represented by these politicians. Like, that's something that you could potentially get behind no matter what your your um, political party is. You know, in this particular case, it's so clear that Walker got a lot of money out of state. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, I see that as, as a kind of a nonpartisan thing. Then there's just the straight up the total amount of money, you know, if you can't run for, you know, if you need $10 million to run for governor, me, you know, as a socialist, I'm already thinking, okay, there's a extreme bias towards, you know, the the wealthy candidates and candidates that are willing to represent wealthy people because that's who can afford to give millions of dollars to to a uh, a candidate. And then it, it, yeah, and and I think the farther left you go, the far the far, the more you get um, into critiques of the recall as a strategy or as a response in general. Like, you know, I like to wonder what if we had taken all that effort that we put into having a recall and putting it and put it into a unionization campaign getting more workers represented by unions, unionizing more workplaces. Yeah. Because if you look at Europe, they're not going to bash unions the way that we do because so many people are represented by unions that people know what they are, they appreciate them for what they do, and you know, and they they understand that not everything a union does is perfect. That's that I mean, I think that's part of the problem. But nothing is ever perfect, right? So maybe maybe it's not necessarily part of the problem, but you know you get what I'm saying. There there's always contradictions contained within any institution. But the thing is, if we had a higher degree of unionization, I don't think anything like this ever could have happened. Yeah. It only was able to happen because unionization in the US is so low that people don't identify with it, they don't feel sympathy for it, they they think that they're going to bash someone else so that they can gain from that the spoils of, of someone else getting a lower standard of living. And that's that's I think part of why Walker's strategy worked. 
people did uh, i think the republicans were pretty successful in this state in making it a the unions aren't for everyone they're for themselves and i mean that message played really well especially with the economy downturn and you know the why does a union person get to make more than i do the mm -hmm. sort of collective pulling everyone down instead of collectively building everyone up and to that point i think that it's a lesson that unions need to learn that in order to gain the support of the community, which is vital, they need to actually be more for not just themselves, but for the community as a whole. And that that's something that American unions haven't done as well as European unions. Yeah. They need to act not out of their interest, but out of the interest of the community, even if they gain nothing from it. Is Just simply raising the wages of your employees is not exactly the same you know give more leisure time or what you know there's there's lots of things that the that a union can do besides just raise the wages of its employees which is something they had done in the past i mean the minimum wage laws uh 40 hour work week you know those are things that they in the past unions have fought and won for everyone not just themselves and they've sort of lost that after because it was also sort of beaten out of them, too. Right. But yes, Spark is another group I'm part of, and they actually, after the recall, kept meeting and work on community engagement um, for elections. They, they uh, do a good job having forums, getting all the candidates out to actually answer questions from people, um, things like that, um, just work better that community. Um, I suppose I should also mention education. I, uh, mm -hmm. I previously studied computer science at the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire, where I did not complete my degree, so I have three quarters of a computer science degree, basically. Starting in fall, I'm actually going to be going back to school to UW-Whitewater for economics, specifically economics because of studying Marx and socialism and having a good, a great interest in it, because I want to understand the capitalist system, not just from a Marxist perspective, but from a capitalist perspective as well. Mm. That way it's easier to point out and possibly, and hopefully, in their terms, point out to them what is fundamentally wrong with the system that they, uh, that they hold so dear. Now... I haven't asked you this before, but I th uh, I feel compelled to ask it now. With three quarters of a computer science degree, did you think at all about um, finishing that degree? Like, w was that a consideration when going back to school? Yeah, um, but the way it transfers in, it does not transfer in as any specific courses. Sure. So I have a bunch of general computer science credits which make that hard so, um okay so the major was a little bit irrelevant at this point like yeah i mean i still i will i have a year to argue with them to get them to cover specific things so i may depending on how that goes end up double majoring maybe but mm -hmm. economics is something that i definitely want to pursue now and i'm very interested in it yeah i can imagine because at, since you've decided to call yourself a socialist and join DSA and and things like that, you've done a lot of reading. Yeah, I've tried to. Yeah. Because not, uh, I mean, it's very you know it's you know if you ask a Democrat or a, or a Republican what major works have you read that represent <laughs> your your viewpoint. Probably the vast majority of them can't tell you anything. Now, I'm sure there's some that will say, you know, like, oh, I read Hobbes or something or what, you know. I so, some don't know how scientist. many of them will say Hobbes. Yeah, probably not. <laughs> I don't know. I have no idea what they've read. But y you know what I mean? They'll be but, like, I read Bill Clinton's memoirs or George W. Bush's memoirs. Or I'm guessing that's what a lot of it's going to be. Probably. It's going to be former politicians' memoirs. I'm going to be honest. I think most will tell you nothing. Yeah. But they, like, have watched some stuff. Like, it's very easy 
uh, in the U.S. to call yourself a Democrat or Republican without really doing your homework about it, right? Like, you don't have to really study it to be one of those. Like, those are th those two you get to be for free. Yeah. But if you want to call yourself a socialist, you need to all of a sudden have done your homework. And I think basically you have. Like, what, what, Try to. tell us a little bit about the stuff that you've, you've read. Um, well, I obviously, I think I started with the Communist Manifesto, maybe, because that's easy, and it's on LibreVox, mm. which is a wonderful thing, and everybody should look at that. Um, so, you know, it's, I think, an hour and a half to listen to the entire thing. So I've listened to that just over and over and over and over. I've read through the first two volumes of Marx's Capital. Um, I want to read the volume third... one and volume two. That's, I mean, that's already. I've, I did volume one on audio book. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't so pick I things up as good on audio. So yeah. the first time through, I wanted to actually read it, mm -hmm. and then I'll go back. I don't know when. Um, probably in commuting to school and listen to it, probably several times over to try and pull more out. The, but then also the infamous volume two. I don't. I mean, that I think puts you in a very small group of people that have read yeah. volume two. Well, I I will be honest, and I probably never would have gotten through volume one or volume two without going with your suggestion hmm. of watching David Harvey's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful lectures on both of them. And oh, I yeah. really hope he's going to do volume three this fall. Because yeah. I've only read he when he's going through volume two, he jumps into volume three a little bit to talk about the uh, agents of economic activity for you know 150 pages or so in there. Um, so I've read a little bit of volume three, and I want to read that more. Otherwise, I've read um, some of Michael Harrington's works, which I am pretty keen on, as he's one of the co-founders of the Democratic Socialists of America. Mm -hmm. I've also dug up some old archive recordings of him and listened to speeches of him, which I think are very fun, and I wish there were more socialist speakers that had been recorded that you could listen to like that. Uh -huh. um, I read a little Cornell West, uh, some David Harvey. I'm currently reading David Harvey. And then, I don't know, I might... Which, which of his are you currently reading? I am near the end of Limits to Capital. Ah, yeah. I, yeah. I, yep, I like that one. Yeah, it's a very, very good one. I only have about 50 pages left. Oh, I'm also reading, I guess, A Brief History of Neoliberalism as well, but uh -huh. that one not as actively, uh -huh. um, which is also interesting. Yeah. And yeah, I don't know. I think I'm trying to decide where to go after this for reading... Because I either want to read about crises, because um, David Harvey's new book is 17 Contradictions in the End of Capitalism, mm -hmm. which is all about crises. And Michael Harrington has a book, which I set aside because it was steeped a little heavy in theory, and I hadn't yet read enough marks to really get my teeth into it, called The Twilight of Capitalism, which is on the similar topic, mm. but, you know, they're written about 30 or 40 years apart, so I think they'd be interesting to read back-to-back. -back. Yeah. Or I might go and read some Lenin and see where exactly I fall on him, because uh -huh. I'm not sure where I fall on Lenin, because I, I, I want to study his theory, and then I want to study more about the Russian Revolution, mm -hmm. and then I'll try and decide where I fall on him. Like, I know where I fall on Stalin. Um, yeah. But Lenin and Trotsky, my opinions are a bit more nebulous because I just have not done the research to really give a firm answer to. Yep. And then I want to hit up Luxembourg at some point. Yeah. Probably after Volume 3. Yeah, the classics there. Lenin, Trotsky, and Luxembourg. Yeah, so that's... That's the researchy stuff I've done. I mean, plus all sorts of little articles and news stuff. And I recently, for my birthday, got a subscription to the Jacobin magazine. Oh, which really? Is, yeah. Oh. Um, it's I really like that magazine. Yeah, I have to be honest. I'm jealous about that. I will, yeah, I'll you have should. to get your old issues and and read. It's your a digital old... subscription. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh well, easy come, easy go. Yeah, but um, yeah, that one's. Uh, I'm very keen on that as well. So, so yeah, I guess that's education and study. <laughs> yeah. 
We it's should, a, yeah, we should have a whole discussion about Lennon sometime after after you. That'll read be some that'll be a while because I've read a little bit about the revolution, but it's it's one of those things that's really hard to get less biased information. I mean, oh, everything yeah. has a bias, yeah, right? but Lenin, especially English things or English language things, are just yeah. It, was... Like it, yeah, can you find an unbiased version of anything about Lenin? Yeah. Oh, I've also read Ingalls too. Uh huh. Yeah. What did you read by him? Conditions of the Working Class in England, eighteen forty four, and what else? Uh, a couple things: socialism, scientific, and utopian mm-hmm. or utopic. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember what else. <laughs> Other things I. No, I've read a biography about Engels too. That was pretty good. The the one you said you'd read it too. I can't remember okay. the name yep. of it. Yeah, Marx's General. Yeah, Marx's General. That's it. Yeah, which was the American name for the book. The European name for the book, or maybe the rest of the world, was like the Frock Coated Communist or something yeah. like that. Yeah, which it... I. I don't know. Usually, I, I, you know, like, you'll get, like, the the only time I see the difference between American stuff and European stuff, uh, as far as publications go, is, like, a Time magazine cover that's different. You know, people will post that on Facebook. And usually I'm offended that the American version is, like, watered down or, like, completely ignores some, like, major event that's going on or whatever. I'm going to be honest. I think the the American version of the title was way better. Yeah. Yeah. I I like that a lot, especially cuz I think that's a good characterization of uh him. Yeah. I really especially since his nickname apparently was the general as well, so. Yeah. Yeah. I I feel like it's a compelling title. It's an accurate title. It's a it's a good title. Like frock coat like the the, the the wearing a frock coat. Uh, first of all, I don't, and probably most Americans don't really know what a frock coat is. I mean, I guess it, I'm, a vision, I'm envisioning a coat, yeah. but I'm not really sure if it's a frock coat. I don't know what that means. And two, I'm not sure it matters what kind of coat he wore. Like, Yeah, my the, best guess is that if you're British, you can easily identify that as upper class for them. Oh. That's my only guess, like, because the... Petticoat is in my head, and I'm not sure exactly what that is. Although that actually might be something that ladies wore. Then. Yeah. For some reason, I think of that as. A is that like the woman? Whatever. I don't, I don't know, know about. Yeah. Clearly, we don't know very much about like the like British words for clothes. Yeah, we are not going to have a conversation about the dialectics of fashion. <laughs> Although. <laughs> That's a good title. I like that. The Dialectics of Fashion. Of Fashion? You would you would read that book. I would probably read that book unless <laughs> it was incredibly I was gonna say boring, but I did get through volume two of Capital. Yeah, you would Which read actually it. I didn't think was I thought here's the weird thing about with readings volume one and two. Volume one is a magnificent book and it is hard to read. It is not it is not easy reading, yeah. and it is hard. It's very, 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 very interesting, and that's what kept me going. Mm-hmm. Volume 2, since Marx died before that was published and didn't get any of Marx's polish that made Volume 1 so dense, it's actually a little easier to read. It wasn't didn't have all the nice language and... Mm-hmm. Like all the literary references yeah. that you get in Volume 1. Yeah, and he just... Uh, the insults as well. Volume oh. 1 is worth reading solely for the way Marx insults uh, bourgeois economists. It is... <laughs> I really think so. I would... Yeah. I, there, you, there should be a book of just Marxist insult Or Marx's insults. Mm-hmm. Um, I do remember that. But yeah, so Volume 2 is a little easier to read. Because, oddly, of Marx's lack of hands-on, since Engels was just trying to put together the, what there was without changing it too much. The, you know the funny part? As you mentioned the insults, I, I remember 
certain parts of volume one based on what I was doing while I was listening to the audiobook. Oh, yeah. Because I was a custodian at the time, and so it was very easy for me to listen to eight hours of audiobook and David Harvey lectures. If that's what I would do. I'd load up my MP3 player and just, you know, go through eight hours of the stuff every day. Um, and I'd be, you know, scrubbing floors or washing windows or whatever. I remember, like, scrubbing this particular floor in this particular building when Marx was tearing apart, I want to say it was John Stuart Mill who, like, had the argument that it was the last hour of the day that oh, created yeah. all the value or something. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> See, it's, I can remember, oh. like, where I was when I listened to that argument. Was he the one who he called something like, a genius in the art of bourgeois stupidity or something like that. <laughs> I, I can't remember uh, specifically. I'm trying but to remember I hope so. in that part. I love <laughs> <laughs> Oh, If I could insult people like that, I would just do that all day. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you'll probably get the It'd opportunity with your, if, when you start taking classes. Yeah, that's not going to help my grades if I call a professor the genius of bourgeois idiocy. Maybe you could. <laughs> maybe you could say that that was how you interpreted a reading that you did. Yeah. Um, That's awesome. When do you do you start taking classes in September then? Yes, in September. So possibly about the time this actually comes out, depending on when we do it. When yeah. we push out. Mm -hmm. So that'll be busy. Yeah, but, so everyone listening to this, you know, say a hurrah for Tony or something. In class, depending on when you're listening to it, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. What would you like the listeners to do for you? Uh, I don't know. I'm sure most of them can empathize with being, <laughs> being bored. Um, yeah, I don't know. I like a hurrah. Hurrah is good. I'm trying to think if there's anything else about me that's interesting. Married? Have a kid? Little boy? Yeah. Be married for five years on the 22nd of August, and my son will be three on September 7th. Yeah. So that's, you know. It is exciting. It's not necessarily important to the listeners. It's important to me. Yeah. Should... Well, it goes into who you are and where you're coming from and, you know, shapes your perspective. Yeah. Um, I'm also, I guess, with the union stuff, I also could mention that I'm coming also from a middle class family, because I mean, you should mention class. Middle oh, to yeah. upper middle class family. My parents currently live out in one of the little suburby things that's not quite attached to town, but not really off of it, where all the houses are stupid and just <laughs> disgusting. Um, I, myself, and my wife are just hovering on the poverty line. Um, again, part of the impetus for going back to school. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I it's it's kind of an interesting perspective to go from uh middle class, comfortable middle class living to a uh, not terribly comfortable check to check, you know, scraping by. Yeah, cuz both you and your wife work, right? Yep, both of us work both part-time because full-time is not easy to find and yeah, yeah, not by choice part time, but part time because that's what you can get. Yeah, and it we're, ends up working out alright because we switch off working and watching our kid, mm -hmm. so we don't have to pay for health care, health care, child care. Well, actually, we don't have to pay for health care because we are so poor and get no benefits through our work that we are actually on the state state health care system really? as well. Yeah. Oh wow. yeah. Yep, both of us work one hour shy of getting benefits. Yeah, okay. That's, so it's yeah, so by 100% by design. No vacation, no sick time, no be no health care, no dental like everybody else does. So this this is my... Because I think that having people work part-time so that you don't have to offer them health care is an awful thing. Oh, yeah. And, and I <laughs> feel like it's so amazingly illogical. But this, this, I think, is at least the first step in um, addressing that politically. I think, I think a lot of people would agree with this, even if they weren't socialists. 
and and I th I think we should eventually move beyond this. But this is this would be my stance as as like an immediate proposal, one that is conceivably possible today. That an employer should pay for a percentage of your health care based on the percentage of hours you work, with 40 being 100%. So if you work 20 hours a week, that employer should have to pay for half of the health care premium for you. And if you work 30, they should have to pay for 75%, and so on. So that way, you know, the, the hiring two half-time workers to do the job of one full-time worker is an even trade-off. Because right. right now an employer can gain by splitting one job into two half-time jobs. And so I, I think it's okay if it, like, if there might be some jobs where it works out better to have two different half-time people for whatever reason. Um, maybe because one of them is going to be sick and then you can call the other one in, for example. I don't know. But, but so I think that's okay if, if a business happens to work better that way. But they shouldn't be rewarded for the fact that they split a full-time job into two half-time jobs. Yeah. You know, that should be an even trade. And the way to do that is to say, it, 40 hours covers 100% of your health care premium or whatever, you know, like a normal employer portion of it. And then less than that covers whatever, you know, a, a proportional amount. Yeah, and it is worse because my position was, it previously had been still part-time, but over the threshold for benefits. So they simply just cut it below the threshold. They just cut your hours. Yeah, when that position opened up and they hired for people. Yeah. And it's it's extra illogical in my situation because it's saving money out of the city's budget but the health care is still getting paid through out of the state budget for health care. And it's uh. all being paid for by taxes anyway. Just Is it the city or the state's budget yeah, that it comes out one, of? So it's one government entity pushing the cost onto another government entity. Yeah. Um, so that's kind yeah. of silly. <laughs> With, well, yeah, which is the same thing that happens in the private sector where they don't provide health care and pay low wages. Those people are still getting health care because we're not an awful society that'll just let them die from, like, simple uh, problems. We're still going to provide health care to them. It's just everyone else then has to pick up the check because the employer won't cover it. Yeah. Like, Walmart is, is the classic example of an employer that probably could cover all of those costs or a, or a large chunk of them. Easily could. Um, and, uh, but... For the vast majority of Walmart workers, it's it's people like you and me paying their health care through taxes. Yeah, which, I mean, I know I don't make a lot in <laughs> money to pay into taxes, but if, you know, I happily pay for... It's one of those other things, too, that may, it probably deserves more of a time is taxes, and that taxes aren't a bad thing. I like it that if my house starts on fire and somebody comes in to shoot me, that my taxes pay for things to solve those problems. <laughs> or like, uh -huh. if I want to drive my car, I don't have to drive through grass everywhere. That there's a road I can drive that on. Mm -hmm. You know, people don't... I, and obviously my employment is all through taxes. Yep. Too. People, I don't think, realize the great value that they get from taxes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, that really, the, the question always has to be, you can't just take a, a hard stance one way or the other. Taxes are always good or taxes are always bad. You know, and not that, I. in fact, I've never met anyone who says taxes are always good, but a lot of people will say taxes are always bad. You know, yeah. like the Grover Norquists of the world and those who have signed on to his philosophy. <laughs> that, I mean, that it's a ridiculous stance to take because it doesn't make sense. To, you know, because the question is, what do you get for those taxes? And if what you get for those taxes is a good deal, then then that's a good thing. You know, that that's it's it's ridiculous to not look at both sides of the equation. Yeah, it's also sort of silly in a capitalist society where they're all about you know efficiency and getting the most bang for your buck. 
that you could do a cost analysis of like looking at like the military how much it costs to do have private contractors do stuff not that I'm advocating that we need to spend more on military stuff but the amount we spend on private contractors versus regular army personnel mm -hmm. is or military personnel is just crazy and it's like that for everything it's you know oh we got to cut this stuff let's let the private private corporation do it and they just i mean they gouge the government hugely for that mm -hmm. yep i i mean i think basically people the story that government is inefficient gets repeated so often and don't get me wrong government can be inefficient and i think a bigger problem is it can be awfully corrupt yeah but the thing is, that is only one, like, you can't just say, so that's bad, and private contracting is, it, there's nothing wrong with it. Of course there's something wrong with it. I mean, the first, the thing that is inherently wrong with it, this is actually the interesting thing, is government isn't necessarily inherently corrupt or inherently efficient, but many times it is. Whereas a private company inherently wants to turn a profit. That that's built into the concept of being a private company is that you want to turn a profit, especially a publicly traded one. Like that's peop why people buy your shares is so that they can, you know, get dividends or shell sell the shares at a higher cost or something. Um. And and that is not you know that doesn't produce cost savings in order to turn that profit or to, you know, sell at a higher rate or you need to um, have value that that is not passed on in, in the form of savings. There needs to be value that's accumulated. Yeah. That, that's the inherent inefficiency. Okay, well, I think that's a good, uh, good introduction to you and me and a few sidebars. So. Yeah, more than anyone ever wanted to know about me. <laughs> Now, one thing that we wanted to do, I think, is to make a plug for how to contact us, because we haven't done that in previous episodes. We want to give a venue to, for contacting us for uh, feedback or questions or, you know, the things that you'd like to see on future episodes. We'd love to uh, get your take on that and to, to know what our audience is thinking. Yeah. So, Especially questions, because I think we want to, at some point hopefully have enough questions that we can just sit down and answer just ton, uh, as many as we can. So, Yeah, yeah. Or at least make it like a part of each episode or something. Yeah. Depending on how we end up formatting it. But we, we want to involve you, essentially. We want to involve you as the listener into our, into our content. So, best way to contact us. We were talking about this beforehand. We think that probably Twitter... Is the best way? Is do you agree with that? Yeah, I think Twitter's probably the best way. I think the second best would probably be the WordPress page and a comment, but I think Twitter's a bit better. Um just because we I don't know, I get notifications of that right away, so. Yeah. Yeah, I I'm more likely to check that too. So if you want to tweet me, you can uh, tweet at Red Wagner, R-E-D-W-A-G-N-E-R-2. That's the number two. Yeah, I didn't get Red Wagner 1 or without a number. I'm Red Wagner 2 on Twitter. So I, I suppose you could tweet at Red Wagner and <laughs> someone else will get the tweet and be very confused. confused. Um, What's your opinion yeah. on dialectics? Yeah, that guy probably likes me a lot. <laughs> uh, and then how, how, how should folks reach you? All right. My Twitter is Schmidt AJ. And to be confusing, I spell Schmidt not the way you're thinking. It's S C H M I. T T A J. There's no D in there. It's not D T. It's not D T T. It's two T's. S C H M I T T A J. That's last name everybody can pronounce and no one can spell. You're M I T T. Yes, two T's. Okay. Two T, no D. I should catch Ray Satter something. <laughs> 
be my trademark. <laughs> okay. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye. That was a weird bye. I'm sorry. <laughs>